Well, I'd like to begin by thanking you for coming along this morning to this event organized by the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Now the headline, the title is The Roadmap to Democratic Cuba. And uh, the question we would seek to answer is, what is the role of civic society? Pavel Telichka and myself prepared this event. And in doing so, the talks between the US and Cuba were not known about. We did have the information we, that was available at that time. And some of these, uh, some of this information continues to obtain. Uh, the uh, leader of the regime is a very poor health. The regime has been around for 58 years. And we all know that dictatorships don't tend to survive their dictators. The economic and social situation, indeed the political situation in the country, is dramatic. I mean, it's a miracle for them to reach not just the end of the month, but to reach the end of the day. So it's against that backdrop that we organized this panel discussion. We wanted uh, people who are knowledgeable about Cuba to share their views and opinions on the future for Cuba, particularly the possibilities for a free Cuba. But then the news that, we, uh, that I mentioned supervened. So that meant this event became all the more important. So how do our experts see the future of the island? Where is it heading? What players, what agents will determine political developments in the country? Regrettably, all our guests couldn't attend. For instance, Antonio Rodiles couldn't come along. He was denied a passport and permission to travel. And I would ask, has anything really changed in Cuba? But I have here my friend Elisardo Sanchez. I was able to visit him in Havana. He was sitting in front of two maps of Cuba. One of these showed the jails in, this, in the island prior to the Castrist uh, revolution, and the second one with the jails in the country. This was five or six years ago. A few holes, a few pins in the old map and lots and lots of pins and dots on the map in the second case. So thanks, Elisado, for coming along, despite uh, the fact that travel was undoubtedly very inconvenient for you. Does the prison regime of Castris Cuba have a possibility of solution? How can it survive? And before I give you the floor, I would ask our speakers to say what they would expect of us. This is a parliament, and words must lead to proposals for action. I think it is the duty of this parliament to become involved in developing this roadmap for a democratic Cuba. First of all, I'd like to give the floor to, to Fernando Pons Canton, Deputy Head of Division for the Caribbean at the European External Action Service. Fernando, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mara, Mr. Trichka, honorable members. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. As, fin as being put in, my name is Fernando Ponce Cantor, Deputy Head of Division for the Caribbean at the European External Action Service. I must apologize on, beh on behalf of Mr. Lefler, our Director General who was unable to attend because of an agenda, a timetable clash. But it is nonetheless a huge privilege to be involved in a debate 
with you on one of the most uh, important topics in uh, foreign relations, and that is EU-Cuba relations. So I'm going to be giving you a presentation on EU-Cuba relations. It's not for me to touch on other issues uh, which uh, you're probably far more knowledgeable about. Nonetheless, I hope my presentation will be valuable to you. I'm trying to stick to my speaking time. I believe it's 15 minutes, so I'll try to be reasonably disciplined so that everybody gets an opportunity to speak in this important debate. As Mr. Mara pointed out, things have been on the move since you started preparing this seminar. Uh, one of the main events, obviously, has been the historic milestone of rapprochement between the USA and Cuba. As you'll be aware, an announcement was made at the end of December about this, and there were to be a series of steps forward, including the, f the release of 53 prisoners on the island, and a, an exchange of detainees uh, in both countries, and a series of other measures. Now, assessments may differ on this, and uh, positions can vary, but nonetheless, everybody uh, would agree that these are historic steps forward And I think it's important for us to sit down and assess these developments. Now, I'd like to begin by once again referring to the main framework for EU-Cuba relations. That's the common position adopted by the EU Council in 1996. I think everyone knows this, but it's well worth recalling it because this r continues to be the starting point for all EU activities relating to Cuba. It's a framework we operate within. Secondly, I'd like to point out that since the adoption of this common position, a lot has happened. And a lot has happened in EU-Cuba relations, and also a lot has happened uh, between individual member states and Cuba. I think it's important to bear that in mind. Uh, I wouldn't care to pass judgment, uh, far be it for me to do that, but I would state the following fact. As of the adoption of the composition, particularly in recent years, there has been a very real trend and particularly among certain member states, among the majority of member states, uh, certainly among the, the, the biggest member states, or member states are equally important, of course, but there has been a trend to establish direct contacts with Cuba. Indeed, in many cases, high-level visits have carried out, and ministerial visits, and so forth. I don't think I need to give you details about this, but as you know, some very high-level people have traveled to Cuba recently. Again, this is the value judgment, and it's certainly not a criticism, but member states of the EU have done this, and it, it is entirely within the gift of member states to have bilateral relations with all countries in the world. And it's for us uh, in the EEAS to be aware of the concerns of member states. And, and that's part of our role in the uh, EEAS. So there's a common position. That's the reference point and has been since 1996. It's a very clear text. It spells out a series of uh, important principles and objectives. And there are there is an interpretation of the common position according to which member states have 
organized their own visits to Cuba, and they have established their own relations. Well, the relations have always existed, of course, but uh, they've established their own contacts. Some have been more intensive, others less so. All of this shows that the time is probably ripe to update the EU's composition on Cuba. And indeed, that's precisely what the uh, European Council decided in 2014. The Council met to discuss the matter and it called on the External Action Service and the European Commission to engage negotiations that might lead to a treaty with Cuba. This would be a political dialogue and cooperation agreement was the main objective. So that's perhaps the third important point to bear in mind. I would very much highlight it. So that's the most relevant recent development, the negotiating guidelines adopted by the Council to negotiate a partnership and a political dialogue agreement with Cuba. I would reiterate, negotiations are negotiations. They're ongoing. Nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. And these negotiations are proceeding and are hugely interesting. Two rounds have already taken place, as you probably know. One in April, um, another in August last year, and a third round uh, came up against certain difficulties. That'll be no surprise. The third round, and this is no secret, was one where the Cuban side showed, shall we say, limited enthusiasm. This was at the end of last year. Now, you can start interpreting why the Cubans weren't terribly enthusiastic. Far be it from me to start speculating. But uh, the fact of the matter is that, that this third round um, was subsequently postponed. And it's an important round because it was in this third session that we are to, to get down to the real brass tacks. In this negotiations, we want to start drilling down into fundamental issues, particularly those relating to values and the interests of the European Union, into all of them, without an exception to spell to set. We will, will certainly be looking at human rights. And that's precisely what we do with all our partners in the world. Let me emphasize that we are not meeting out different treatment to Cuba. We're treating Cuba exa in exactly the same way as all other countries. And in these negotiations, our aim, our mindset, is to engage in negotiations, to discuss everything in a spirit of trust and transparency. We want to speak candidly with our Cuban interlocutors. But we certainly, above all, want to put everything on the table. We want to broach everything we need to. We believe that this draft agreement will allow us to promote the values and interests of the European Union all the better. We think it's going to be a framework that will allow us to further pursue our policies, including our our policies to defend human rights, but um, we believe we'll be able to do so through the agreement in a more efficient and stronger fashion. And we also do it in a more binding way. We create a binding framework. And this binding framework would include political dialogue. This is an important point. Sometimes this is misinterpreted. People think, that uh, this is something altogether different. These negotiations seek to lead to a political dialogue.
dialogue and cooperation agreement. And as with other partners, it will allow us to tackle anything and everything. And that certainly includes human rights. We certainly intend to, to cover human rights. In our political dialogue with all countries in the world, there are clear di guidelines. The EU raises human rights always. And we certainly intend to do this with Cuba. No, but if we're to broach human rights in a political dialogue, there has to be political dialogue in the first place. We can't start on human rights without that, that uh, political dialogue. And it's a bit of a cir circular situation. We can't in any way anticipate the results of negotiations because they're still ongoing. But we believe that at the end of the line, at some point, there should be an agreement that will allow us to continue defending the same values more than ever. So we hope it, it'll be a tool that will allow the EU to discuss all matters of interest to it. We're not, we aren't going to be talking just about values, obviously. We will also be talking about our interests. That's part of our remit. This is part of what the External Action Service does. I don't know uh, if I should continue much further, but one point I would like to make before I conclude. The Council asked us to open this set of negotiations, and that suggests that the Council believes that certain minimum conditions were in place to allow negotiations to begin. Here, I point out that we believe that the interpretation of the, of the member states is that there has been change in Cuba, change which has allowed these negotiations to start. If not, I, Council wouldn't have asked us to begin the negotiations. There are certain reforms on the island one can, one can point to. Private private activity is uh, tolerated or allowed more than before, though albeit to a limited degree. Uh, reforms are ongoing. Private entrepreneurship seems to be growing. I think the aim is to generate 500,000 uh, private sector jobs by 2016. Private property. Sales are allowed. Markets seem to be arising. There's a reform in agriculture and a number of other economic reforms. We have also noted that there have been reforms in migration policy too. Now, once again, I'd say that, that it wouldn't have been difficult to improve migration policy because what they had was something extremely restrictive. But nonetheless, progress has been made. There have been improvements. Certainly, that is our assessment of the situation. To be clearer, Cuban citizens can hope to travel abroad and to hope to return as well, which is obviously important if you're to travel uh, calmly. But regret regrettably, there's been uh, some steps backward, too. And I think we've got to mention this, too, because we need to have a balanced view of the situation. We need to be strictly objective and realistic. Now, let me mention some of those steps backwards. An increase in short-term detentions. That's a source of very serious concern. In 2014... This uh, phenomenon has grown worse. I believe 8,900 short-term arrests were carried out. Fortunately, at least they were short-term. But nonetheless, these arrests did take place. In 
the last few months of last year, it seemed that the uh, phenomenon was abating a little, but nonetheless, we have to keep a weather on this problem and also on other problems such as those mentioned by Mr. Maurer. Anybody who wants to travel to Cuba or travel outside Cuba has to provide grounds for it. And Mr. Mara has mentioned this, and our delegation Havana and our services here will do whatever we can to improve the situation and to expedite the modernization and reform of the country. But of course, you know, we have to operate within diplomatic conventions. But I, th I think, nonetheless, we can still act with resolve. Our delegation has frequent contacts, ongoing contacts, with any dissidents that uh, gets in touch with it, and, and that's not going to change. Now, obviously, we, we have to be discreet in a lot of cases because we know, in many cases, our interlocutors want that. They want us to, to, to be discreet. But we will continue to uh, work along these lines. I think I could probably leave it at that. I've tried to stick to, sp uh, to my speaking time, and, but uh, certainly if you have any question, I'd be happy to try to reply. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now give the floor to Pavel Telichka, who will moderate the debate. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, a very good morning. Uh, I must say that uh, it's uh, a pleasure and honor at the same time uh, to uh, jointly with uh, Fernando co-organize the event, <coughs> which uh, when we first thought of it, I thought uh, uh, could aim at putting Cuba back on the radar screen, uh, also when primarily in terms of uh, respect for human rights. Now. Um, we are a little bit behind schedule, uh, and uh, I would really like uh, to have at least half an hour for an interactive debate between the panelists and also uh, with you uh, present here today in the room, but also to maybe uh, have it more lively for also the viewers on stream. This event is being streamed, so I think that uh, the outreach is uh, definitely greater than just uh, this room. Uh, I'm sure that uh, those of you that uh, came to this event know the panelists very well, so I will skip uh, the introduction of each and every single of them uh, just for the sake of catching up a little bit uh, with the time. And the uh, thing that I need to do is ask uh, all the speakers uh, for discipline so that uh, we can really arrive 20 past 10 uh, uh, at a point when we can open uh, the debate. So the first uh, speaker would be Martin Palos. Uh, uh, I need not to introduce him. He's not a Cuban, uh, though if, if you look at him, you could think that uh, uh, taking into account his color, but that's because he's mainly based today in Florida, but he's Czech and he's been dealing with Cuban uh, affairs uh, for, I would say now, already a couple of decades. So Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Obviously, it's uh, apt first to thank the organizers, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe in European Parliament to host this event, uh, the timing of which could not be, in my view, uh, uh, better. Why? Uh, the decision of the US and uh, Cuban governments announced simultaneously on December 17 of the last year, they announced their intention to re-establish the diplomatic relations between the two countries has undoubtedly added a new dynamism into a debate we are having right now and it opens new horizons, uh, horizons before us. Uh, the attempts to normalize the relations with Cuba, uh, which are on the way now on all three major fronts, uh, with the United States, with the European Union, and in the regional context of Latin America and Caribbean, however, brings in one central question, uh, which should be raised first, in my view. What actually such a normalization means? What is its expected outcome? Uh, what are uh, its implications, effects, on the hopes, ambitions, dreams of uh, Cubans themselves uh, uh, to overcome the totalitarian past of their country and see it finally on the path towards democracy? If I'm uh, allowed to make uh, the following simplification, uh, there seem uh, to be 
still two schools of thought uh, among Cuban participants in this debate. Uh, as it has been proven again and again in the reaction to the President Obama's decision to engage Cuba, there is still a large and vocal group of skeptics here uh, who keep saying uh, what they were saying in the past. A totalitarian regime uh, which has come into existence 56 years ago now is still in place in Cuba using its traditional methods of control and manipulation uh, developed in the past decades, uh, fully endorsing its original ideological visions and subscribing to its revolutionary program based on them. The current Cuban leader, President Raul Castro, may be advancing uh, some economic reform policies with the intention of actualization of socialism, but it does not mean at all, however, that he has stopped to be in his deepest belief an unrepentant and believing communist. He has never ever made even the smallest hint that he and his uh, associates would be ready and willing to extend the economic reform agenda also to the political sphere, to really open the Cuban society, having been closed now for almost 60 deca six decades, and by complying with generally recognized democratic rules and standards uh, uh, to give up their monopoly of power. The second group is using uh, the following basic argument. The policies of the past um, have not produced any positive results. Uh, so, as President Obama said in his uh, State of the Union address, let's try something new. It is true uh, that the basic intention of the ruling totalitarian regime remain uh, the same as it had been uh, throughout the past more than five decades. Uh, what should not be overlooked and underestimated at the same time, however, is another simple fact. Regardless how strong the survival instincts of Cuban totalitarian regime are, regardless the current policies of its protagonists, combining the process of economic reforms with the steps necessary to keep the existing political order intact and themselves in power, there is a growing number of new elements characterizing the current Cuban situation, which are not and by their very nature cannot be under their control. In spite of all the efforts of the current power holders to preserve the status quo, uh, the present social uh, reality in Cuba is irreversibly, irreversibly different uh, now from the past and is changing with ever growing speed. Uh, Cuba se cambia. Uh, as a famous blogger, Ioannis Sanchez simply put it, and no government of Cuba can stop this trend. The really smart and result-oriented international negotiations must take all these new realities uh, being established step by step on the ground into consideration and use them creatively to achieve their own objectives. To bring Cuba to the path of democratization, to respect the will of Cuba people and start opening the Cuban society, which has been closed now almost for, six, uh, for 60 years. That's clear. So let me now uh, uh, comment on what already you have heard here. The state of the EU-Cuba uh, negotiations, uh, I actually forgotten to say that uh, this is one of our major priorities, priorities of our international platform for human rights in Cuba. I have the honor to represent here uh, to focus on the process of negotiation uh, of a new bilateral treaty between the EU and Cuba. And in this context, to try to strengthen the capacity of Cuban civil society activists to engage the European Union on the issue of human rights and also obviously to understand uh, sometimes complex and uh, uh, uneasy processes, uh, uh, the way how the European Union operates and how it does its own business. So as you know, uh, it was said in February this year, uh, the European Union, the Council of European Union Foreign ministers agreed to start negotiations about the new bilateral treaty between the EU and Cuba. And I think that there are, uh, there, uh, there are two things that need to be stressed here. Uh, the Council arrived at a conclusion the new treaty should govern the full scope of relationships between the EU and Cuba, which means political dialogue, cooperation, economic relations and trade in a single agreement. And that this uh, agreement should be a standard legal instrument 
similar to the treaties regulating the relations of the EU with other states of uh, this ACT, uh, African, Caribbean, and Pacific group. Uh, um, all of them, unlike Cuba, are uh, signatories of the Cotonou Agreement. Uh, so uh, this is the goal, and then uh, what the uh, EU negotiation directives for this uh, agreement emphasize uh, is uh, what is the role of human rights here. And it says very clearly that uh, the respect for and promotion of democratic principles, human rights and fundamental freedoms as set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the core international human rights instruments and their optional protocols, and for uh, the rule of law should constitute an essential element of a new agreement. I think it's an interesting question already for uh, lawyers what uh, essential element of agreement means, and especially if you want in this agreement to combine all uh, um, elements, the cooperation between the EU and Cuba should uh, be consisting of political dialogue on the one side and also uh, cooperation in the area of uh, economy, uh, trade, and other issues. Uh, I will end up by comparing this situation with something what we know from our own perspective way in the past. The Helsinki process, uh, by the way, we will be celebrating this year the 40th anniversary of the um, uh, adoption of the final act um, uh, of Helsinki conference uh, um, in summer of that year that also did something very uh, unusual to brought into one context three different baskets. Uh, uh, peace and security, economic cooperation, and human rights. Human rights in this uh, context looked like an appendix, something that was put there maybe uh, for formal reasons, but not uh, uh, to be seen as a priority number one. But it turned out that this third basket was most dynamic uh, element in this context and managed to change the situation. So I think that interconnectivity with these uh, three things mm. is absolutely a uh, uh, center issue. And when uh, obviously we can only observe uh, the uh, mm, uh, EU uh, negotiators with the government of Cuba, then obviously my question would be, uh, what should come the first? Uh, shall we start from economic cooperation and go from there to more difficult, more politically sensitive issues or take them uh, uh, together and uh, uh, not uh, to give to the other side first what do they want, which means uh, uh, more economic cooperation and then uh, uh, reluctance in the area of human rights. Uh, what was mentioned here also is a common position. Uh, former uh, High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security uh, Policy uh, and European Commission Vice President Catherine Ashton stated in the moment when this decision uh, was made uh, uh, that human rights still remain uh, at the core of the relationship and that common position during the process of negotiation is still in force. I don't want to go to somewhat scholastic debate here, uh, what, what should come first, what should come uh, second, but uh, uh, it must be noted that uh, maybe EU made a certain concession here to start the negotiation with the current state of human rights and then Cuban government at the same time made also a concession to start the negotiation with the common position still in place, which was uh, what they didn't want. Uh, I'm reminded of a time, so I will speed up my presentation. Um, uh, what I would like to say is that on the side of Cuban uh, 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 dissidents or democratic opposition, uh, there is now a question how these processes should be perceived received positively as a chance, as a hope, or as a treason, as a compromise, as a attempt to normalize the relationship and uh, let them uh, in certain type of uh, vacuum or let them out. I think that is the call um, uh, which says very clearly, uh, resist totalitarianism effectively requires not only strength and resilience at on the home turf, but also a powerful enough action-oriented and informed international plan projection capable to face up three following challenges. Uh, and these three challenges is what I'm going to uh, finish with. Uh, the challenge number one is 
to integrate, if possible, all the groups, currents, initiatives existing within the community of human democrats, human rights defenders, civil society activists, bloggers, free media, uh, uh, to step together and in one voice in the process of the EU-Cuba negotiations. I think that that's something what's going on right now, and my colleagues, I hope, uh, will be reporting on that. Uh, challenge number two is to open effect, uh, effective working channels of communication, not only with the EU institutions and in charge of the negotiations, but also with the European Parliament, what is going on right now, and also uh, the EU member states, and raise there the demands of participation of civil society in this process. That's what we are trying to do, uh, again, jointly together, working here in Brussels, but also in the European capitals, and try to bring that message to these quarters. And the last challenge, number three, is to bring effectively their inputs and contributions into the process taking place among politicians and diplomats, dealing with often very concrete and narrowly defined questions concerning all aspects of the future, future EU-Cuba cooperation. It's my belief that human rights is not only a matter of uh, political dialogue, but all policies of the European Union in the area of uh, economic cooperation also are based on human rights principles. So I think that this debate should not be only about abstract things, about great concepts, but about concrete activities in this particular field. And this is what our platform is trying uh, uh, to uh, help with, and uh, we hope that uh, we will see some positive results in the end of this process. Thank you. Martin, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, knowing Martin uh, pretty well, I must say that he really proved a lot of discipline because uh, I expected that he would be less disciplined, more time. But I already see a few points uh, of contradiction between what uh, Mr. Ponskanto has said and what uh, Mr. Paloš have said. Uh, uh, so I think that it is already the first injection into the debate. Apart from the, the conclusion, the three points, I see a strong emphasis on conditionality. I think that, uh, that I felt it very strongly there. Um, I would like to stress that uh, Martin's uh, point of view is not just uh, of a person that is uh, uh, involved in uh, Cuban affairs for a long period of time, but uh, Martin also, as his title uh, speaks for, was a very close collaborator of uh, uh, late uh, President Václav Havel, a good friend of his, and uh, was among the uh, leading Czech dissidents uh, bef before 89. So I think that from him we can see also maybe a certain contribution uh, of, the, of uh, certain aspects of polari uh, polarism. Sorry. Now, uh, as we have been informed by Fernando, unfortunately, uh, we could not uh, get uh, Antonio Ardiles uh, to our event today. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, if I would uh, quote uh, uh, Mr. Ponskanto saying that uh, things are on the move, uh, well, this is in a complete contradiction to uh, anything uh, uh, that uh, I would consider, or something that I would consider really uh, the very basic uh, freedom. But, uh, uh, I would, uh, at this point, like to invite uh, Eric Dinesh maybe to also deliver on his uh, behalf. I are we ready in, in uh, IT terms? We are. So uh, uh, we don't have Antonio here uh, physically, but uh, we will have an opportunity still uh, to, to listen to him, and I think we can, we can launch it now. Thank you. Buenas, mi nombre es Antonio González Rodiles, soy activista político. Hello, my name is Antonio González Rodríguez. I'm a political activist on Cuba, and I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you, and I particularly like to thank Pavel Talitska and Fernando Mara. We're living through a fundamental time in our country. For 57 years, Cuba has been the victim of a dictatorship that has violated its human rights systematically, and now we have reached a fork in a road. We want Cuba to move from an authoritarian system uh, where uh, the uh, families of those who are in power continue in power, or we can move towards a democracy where there's a rule of, rule of law and Cuba can endure for the benefits of uh, the country and prosperity. I think the first way forward is very dangerous. Uh, in this context, countries are moving towards democracies. But not always the case, because sometimes you, ha you have countries where you have authoritarian systems in place, and that's happening to certain uh, former communist countries, and that is the case 
in Latin America to uh, Venezuela being one of the most record places. We want that kind of future for our country. We really want to transition towards democracy. Well, Cubans can enjoy their fundamental freedoms and fully exercise their civil and political rights. And it's on the basis of, of this that we are working. We recently created a forum for freedoms and uh, uh, rights, which calls for the ratification and implementation of uh, human rights instruments of the United Nations. We've drawn up a roadmap which uh, would run in par parallel to this implementation. We call for the immediate release of political freedoms, changes to the legal system, so as to allow respect for the international treaties and also the repeal of uh, legal inventions which allow for the arrest of Cubans at any time. We also call for a new media law, a new uh, law on the freedom of association, free elections, and of course an end, uh, 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 or in the end, what we want is a constituent process where Cubans can decide what way forward they want for the country. We hope that the international community will back us in this path. We are working against a, re a regime which violates our rights uh, systematically and with impunity. We think it's hugely important that in the bilateral agreement we include these rights. A few months back, we gave a document to Mr. Christian Leffler where we carry out a comparative study between the association agreements signed with Central America and what we would hope would be a bilateral agreement with the Havana regime. The agreement clearly emphasizes promoting democracy and human rights. This includes certain countries, Nicaragua, which be belong to the Bolivarian integration system, which was uh, recently created, Cuba being a member of this too. We believe the region should not be held to standards any lower. That's why we ask for the support of the international community, not just the EU, uh, but also the United States, which has recently opened the way forward to political dialogue and indeed the support of Latin America. Without effective pressure, without uh, preconditions on this, uh, on this regime, we will basically uh, be rubber stamping a transfer powers which will condemn us to 20 or 30 years of living in a political straitjacket which uh, uh, is uh, the product of despotism. We hope that our petition and our appeal will be heard um, we are optimistic that in future years in Cuba, we will see democracy and that the Cuban nation will be part of the community of democratic countries. Thank you very much, and we hope to count on your support. Well, uh, thank you. I need to say uh, that uh, Antonio didn't make it to this time, but uh, he was here in the European Parliament for bilateral talks uh, with uh, some of the MEPs, including Fernando and myself, just uh, two two months ago or so, uh, uh, so we are in, in close contact with him and uh, I, I'm hoping still that he will make it uh, uh, some other time. Uh, Nando and myself, this is not a one-shot event. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we will want to keep uh, uh, the relations with Cuba and especially the internal developments in, in Cuba high on our agenda. Alde, uh, you could have a look at the, the abbreviation uh, stands for liberal, therefore liberal in economics. Uh, and in other respects as well, but also Democrats. And I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, potentially the agreement with Cuba can bring, uh, uh, can bring uh, a significant, uh, let's say, impetus uh, to the development in Cuba, but, and I think that the debate today is about the, uh, these buts, and we definitely do not intend uh, from the side of ALDE to, to compromise on our respect on, on human rights. Now, we were to have with us uh, Mrs. Paya, a person that I did not to introduce. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she could make it still a few days ago. Uh, she, she was coming, but we are happy to have uh, Karima Imanara Burza here with us, and uh, I'm sure that uh, she will uh, uh, say a few words on uh, Madame Paya's uh, behalf, but also on her own. Please. Good morning. It's an honor to. Uh, speak on behalf of Rosa Maria Paya here in the European Parliament. But on my own behalf, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you, this opportunity to convey to you how we're feeling, how we're interpreting the needs of civil society in Cuba today. Rosa Maria isn't here, but she's with us in spirit. And I'll read out uh, her text. 
Uh, we've had some technological blips to face, uh, but nonetheless, here goes. Thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, we also have this in English. ...to our people to be isolated or excluded. But the real cooperation would only be true if it is performed among free people. The dialogue that has been proclaimed so far will be fraudulent one. And no have no future if it is not a result of the exercise of the freedom of the Cuban people. There cannot be a respect for ourselves if the determination is not negotiated without mentioning that we need to be organized. In other words, a first voting that will be unable them to decide freely among the changes of the Cuban needs. Um, Rosa Maria intenta expresarnos a todos. Rosa Maria is trying to convey to all of us that the values of democracy must be applied in Cuba. We are counting on the support and cooperation of everybody. But above all, please respect the right of Cubans to associate, to work out among ourselves what we want, what's best for us. She believes that we can only achieve this through free pluralist elections. In such elections, Cubans, as we've heard uh, by Mr. Rodiles, Cubans are still subject to arbitrary arrest. There are still bogus deals cut. And uh, changes are announced which aren't real changes. Now, we're, we're, uh, we're accepting these changes, though they're co purely cosmetic. They engage in negotiations. Uh, um, then a few days later, after the, an, an agreement is reached, there are thousands of people detained. Some political prisoners are released, others not. Why? We have very little access to information in Cuba. We only have access to, to, to 3 to 5 percent information. Cubans just don't know what their rights are. Cuba, the bulk of the population at large simply do not know what their rights are. So back us in the democratic process in Cuba so that the Cubans can go to the polls in a way that's affected. I get to choose. I, uh, I and my family choose the educational system. I'm voting because I want my children to be able to say what they think. So we want your backing. We're deeply grateful to you for all your cooperation for, for the debates. But let's focus on the primary needs of Cubans. We're not talking about a, a plate of beans and rice on the plate. That, that's secondary if people simply do not know. In Guantanamo, uh, inland, Baracoa, in Santiago, in Pinar del Rio, your ordinary Cuban does not know what their rights are. They're, they're scared of knowing. More and more people try their luck on the seas. People don't even have a reference point to say, I want, I'm choosing. So we want communication to take place. Now, this communication can be as simple as a letter to a Cuban who lives uh, inland of the island, who reads the letter and says, well, look, apparently I have the right to choose. I can talk to who I want to and talk about what I want with them. I can choose what school my kids go to. I can determine whether I come and go to a country without the government deciding who go, gets to go uh, or come back. But the government always decides these things. The government says, you can go, you can't. I have the power to give you a passport. I, 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 I can't go to the post office and say, well, because I want to take a trip to India or something. No, that simply does not happen in Cuba. We need the support of Democrats across the world. We want people to say these people want to do something, but they don't have the information. So we're very limited by a lack of information. Detentions will continue. 
there will be continued fear, fraud, and continued bogus negotiations. We in Cuba, we need to vote. But first, we need to be aware of what we are entitled to, what our rights are. Without that, we're not going to get very far. We will continue as we are, hopefully for not very long. But if we don't empower ourselves through the media and communication, and we won't be able to do that with that support of democracy throughout the world. We need a bit of extra strength. We need that final fillip, that final push across the line. It's not enough to say, I want this. We need to acknowledge that democratic processes elsewhere in the region could also happen in Cuba. History and geography conditions are somewhat But please, I'd ask all Democrats in the world to be united, to, to back us all. I'd ask every single MEP to, to be aware of the limited access to information Cubans have. They have very little information about how many political prisoners are and, uh, and how people are forced uh, into the situation. So on behalf of Rosa Maria and on my own behalf, thank you. Uh, I must say very, very strong words, uh, uh, I mean emotionally strong words, uh, uh, words like uh, how we are feeling, how we mean uh, the Cubans living in Cuba, the uh, representatives of the democratic uh, opposition Cuba, how we are feeling. People do not know what their rights are. People are detained from information. Just a few percent of people have an access to reasonable information. Changes in Cuba considered to be purely cosmetic. And I think that uh, Karim has uh, emphasized, like some of the pre-speakers, what the real issues at stake are, which issues cannot be compromised. Uh, support, uh, support to uh, Cubans making uh, themselves the choice. I'm sure we will return to some of these points later on. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, Alessandro Sanchez, I think uh, another figure that doesn't need any introduction whatsoever. Alessandro, it's, it's good to have you with us and I would ask uh, now for your contribution. Thank you one and all. And it's a pleasure to, to be able to see our friends here at the top table. And it's a great pleasure to meet MEPs here today, and particularly Fernanda Mara um, and Pavel Tilichka. They are to blame for my presence today, for they invited me. And I'd like to thank the uh, Liberal group for taking in hand uh, the practicalities. It was 29, 30 degrees in Cuba when I left. So I pretty much froze to death as soon as I arrived. I have a few minutes to speak to you. I'll be disciplined, don't worry. No, I could uh, give you a litany of woes uh, uh, describing the situation in Cuba, and, I, and I've lived there. Uh, I supported the revolution back in 59, which enjoyed a great deal of popular support. 90, 95% of the people supported it. But this government morphed into a dictatorship. And it's uh, been in power for 56 years. People sometimes ask, why, why, why do you talk so much about this small country which you can barely see? Uh, on the map, 11 million population. What makes us special is that we've been suffering a dictatorship for over 50 years. Its main personalities perhaps would like to remain in power for a further 56 years, which is obviously going to be impossible, but I'm sure you're aware that these people believe they are immortal 
but obviously uh, they're on their way out. Developments have moved ahead apace. Uh, in inland, in Cuba, and that's where I'm from, the situation is the same. Mm, I'll be back tomorrow and I'll be under the very vigilant eye of the secret police of the regime. And they are the central pillar of uh, totalitarian power in that country. And uh, who's, who's the head of this? Well, it was Fidel Castro for many years. Now it's his brother. They govern the country in a very cruel fashion through this massive uh, secret police. And then they're not subject to any kind of control or scrutiny. So, having said that, I hate to say this, okay, there's the agreement with Washington, and there is a high degree of expectation, which my, my, my uh, friends have been very optimistic uh, been about. Nonetheless, the situation is of hopelessness and poverty. Mrs. Karima Colmenero, I hope I have mispronounced it, very eloquently said that we need the backing of the civilized world, of the democratic world. Many people in that democrat would say, well, look, uh, every country has the government it deserves. I mean, if the, if the Cubans want freedom, let them earn it. Indeed, well, it's for each uh, people to fight for freedom, but... Uh, in Cuba, we need special help from the international community. Because what we have in Cuba is too much for us to handle on our own. We've got a regime, a, mo uh, a model of the state which is totalitarian, which has huge power to intimidate. It can intimidate people individually, personally. So, so we're bound hand and foot. Anybody who speaks out is, suffers reprisals. A good example is our friend Antonio Rodriguez, a, a very talented young composer, by the by, who for some activity or other, who spoke out and he was punished. He's not allowed to leave the country and he can't uh, deliver on a series of commitments he had. So essentially, the regime is the same. They're intolerant and are happy to intimidate people left, right and centre. Now we in Cuba are not a people of heroes. So there, there are heroic peoples out there, but we Cubans seem to do a better job at organising carnivals and uh, welcoming tourists. We're a peaceful people. There's, there, there's a myth that's surrounding the the warrior spirit of Cubans and uh, that, that in large part is actually part of castrist uh, propaganda because they've sent people to Africa to Latin America and so forth but we Cubans are basically profoundly peaceful and peaceable and Fidel Castro who's proved the most skillful ruler of the country and I mean this in the worst possible sense has uh, managed to exploit this. And that's why he's uh, been able to do more or less what he's wanted. He's exploited the peaceable uh, character of uh, Cubans to ensconce himself in power. I'm a human rights defender. I'm not. Before I, I had a job at the university, but that's a long time ago. And in the interim, I was also in prison. Uh, I, know, I know that some Cuban friends two out there in the room were also in jail. So I have nothing to add uh, to the uh, brilliant presentations we've heard today. Yeah, but I would make this point. Okay, there's been an agreement between Havana and Washington. The Human Rights Commission, which I represent, has said that this is a positive step forward these governments aren't uh, at war, be it cold or hot, but uh, instead have gone back to the negotiating table. I mean, we, we, 
we don't want a situation as between Israel and Palestine. It's we want Washington uh, and Havana and indeed all peoples to resolve their differences peacefully and without violence. It seems uh, almost impossible that uh, diplomatic relations will not be reestablished, but the situation remains the same. Occasionally, um, as a kind of one-off, for instance, you get developments. We've seen a dramatic uh, drop-off in the number of political arrests, but they're still happening. The Washington regime managed to get scores of uh, political prisoners released. But there are quite as many still in jail today. It'd be a good time for the EU's external action service and uh, the parliament and the EU as a whole to ne take note of the fact there are still political prisoners in Cuba. And you should look into freeing, uh, freeing them. Uh, some, if not all. I'm sorry to speak in such uh, basic terms. But... Um, <clears throat> Gradually, let's close the Cuban gulag. Oscar Arias, a P Nobel Peace Prize winner, said that there shouldn't be a single political prisoner in any democratic countries because if there's, there is even one political prisoner, it means there's a problem with democracy in the country in question. We hope that the EEAS delegation will play its role. I imagine it's probably not the appropriate time for the council or parliament, but we hope that in March, uh, the new negotiating round will take place. And my colleagues and myself on the island hope that Brussels diplomacy will achieve tangible results. The Cuban government is currently looking for foreign support, and they perhaps want to balance their relation with uh, Washington with relations with Brussels. Now, it's not a question of taking uh, the, the... Let me put it this way. They've turned the country into prison, and that's not acceptable. When there were 14 uh, jails in Cuba when they came to power, 4,000 prisoners... Or, or common criminals, basically, today. There are 200 prisons or prison camps in Cuba, and between 60 and 70,000 people in jail. And we estimate 100 are political, uh, political prisoners, and then thousands are in jail. They're innocent. because they, they're deemed to be socially dangerous, uh, though it hasn't led to crime. Pre-criminal antisocial attitudes, that's what they call it. The good news is that uh, the political opposition, the human rights activists in Cuba, and the democratic forces uh, that are part of civil society in its independent form in Cuba agree on about 95% of all issues. Now, it does uh, generate column inches uh, sometimes to write about uh, divisions. I mean, political opposition, the human rights advocates are not quite the same term. We're not divided. Actually, we're multiplied, if I can put it that way. 25 years ago, militant dissidents such as Mr. Havel and his friends, or, or Andrei Sakharov and, uh, and his people in the Soviet Union, were very few in number. There were probably fewer than 10. Now there are thousands of us in the whole country. There, there are scores of different groups. Sometimes they, they, they debate or discuss with each other, but, but the oldest among us, they say, look, uh, you agree on 90, 95% of issues. Focus on that. But uh, but that's possibly our Spanish background that makes us fractious. If there are 
if there are two Cubans, you've got a discussion. If you've got three Cubans, you've got a political party, as the old joke goes. So there's a great deal of agreement. We've also identified a series of issues of consensus. I'm just saying this so you take note. The unconditional release of all remaining political prisoners. Washington managed to get uh, quite a few released, but uh, there were conditions attached. It wasn't unconditional release. We must insist that if Cuba wants to engage in dialogue with uh, the EU, then it's got to play by the EU's rules on human rights. So that would mean ratification of the two human rights pacts, the, the human rights instruments that have already been referred to. Cuban society is, is pluralist despite the iron fist of the dictatorship. So we must acknowledge that plurality. And that means accepting political pluralism. And that means political parties should be allowed in a country uh, in the run-up to free and fair elections as soon as possible. Finally, we all agree that civil society, nascent as it is, should be acknowledged as a valid interlocutor on all matters. You'll say, well, Washington didn't talk to civil society, and that's why uh, some of my counterparts are very angry indeed. But uh, you'll understand in a big political like Brussels, states operate in this fashion. If they're engaged in secret talks, they can't really consult anybody in civil society because as soon as they start engaging in consultation, it's uh, not secret. And it would seem that the key to to uh, success in this uh, uh, dialogue with the, with the Castro dictatorship, it's a rather strong term, but there it is. So between the Castro dictatorship and Washington, they managed to achieve something precisely thanks to the fact that uh, the discussions were secret. But I have to express the serious skepticism we feel in my association, the, the Human Rights and Reconciliation Council, because really the, the uh, regime just wants to keep uh, being a dictatorship. It wants to just keep at it and continue to live on as a dictatorship. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, we are coming now to the, uh, the uh, Q&A part, but uh, though uh, Rick is standing here or sitting here for uh, Antonio uh, Rodiles, uh, I still would ask him in, in two minutes maybe what would be his, his main message. I know that I see his presentation uh, being prepared, but uh, we need to give uh, room uh, for a debate, uh, and I'm definitely going to refer a number of the questions to you. So if you could utilize two, three minutes uh, for the main message you would like to leave with us. Uh, never mind the presentation then. I think the core issue we should uh, uh, live with as Europeans is that we, in our foreign policy, we transmit the same values as we uh, cherish in our own continent. And the core one is the right of one and everyone to, of course, express themselves freely and everything, but also to take part. So when the European Union is negotiating with countries abroad that are not free democratic countries are, as ours, we need to take that right, we need to take their right to take part in public affairs in, in, in consideration in our foreign policy. We cannot have a foreign policy where we avoid speaking with the Cuban civil society. And I was living, uh, listening very carefully to, to uh, Fernando Poscanto when he was speaking, and I don't think you even mentioned the civil society in your presentation. So if we want to live by the, the, the values that we cherish, we need to take that the right of the Cubans to participate in the public affairs of their own country we need to recognize that their right, and we need to take that right into consideration when we debate. And that means that we need to create a transparent and a, um, and a formal 
methodology when we negotiate. These negotiations are not secret. So when negotiating with the, with the Cuban, we need to create a space, a formal and transparent space where the Cuban civil society can participate with their own opinions and their own ideas on what to add into this agreement. And uh, maybe these were my two minutes. Well, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the message is uh, not only uh, very clear, uh, loudly said, but uh, definitely on the side of uh, the parliament uh, well received. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I will now open the debate uh, um, and I already uh, see a few names uh, on my list, uh, but if you would ask me, uh, if you would allow me to abuse a little bit uh, uh, the fact that I'm uh, moderating it, I would kick off by one uh, very brief and uh, simple question to Mr. Ponscanto. Uh, you know, well, I think that you heard a number of uh, contributions from the civic society. In fact, even saying that uh, the civic society the Cuban opposition is somehow left out, that it's not really integrated, being uh, spoken to. While you did refer, I need to uh, uh, make that point, uh, that you are, your services are in contact uh, with uh, uh, the dissent. But uh, would you say, on the background of what you have heard, on the background of what you have said, that uh, the, the mandate really reflects the demand that is being uh, said uh, clearly and loudly here, uh, because I do see a number of points of contradiction between what you have said and what has been spoken out here uh, at the panel. Just a very quick uh, response, if you may, uh, if you can, uh, within a minute plus minus, so that we could then give the floor to uh, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tereshka, for giving me this opportunity to recall some points which I think I highlighted in my presentation. I talked about uh, the problems that exist, such, uh, such as uh, political rest. I've talked about progress and steps backward. I think it's important to refer to both. And, um, and among these steps backward, I, I mentioned uh, Political detentions and the figure I give it is from the from the Mr. Elisardo Sanchez's uh, organization. Eight thousand nine hundred short-term detentions last year, and that shows that we got contacts with civil society. We have contacts with human rights defenders, and as Mr. Sanchez right pointed out, the human rights uh, organizations and political organizations can be different. But we clearly we get our information from different sources. We don't just get it uh, from one source. We get it from very many sources. Before I came to this conference today, I was reviewing the contacts uh, between our Havana delegation and civil society. Just last year, I can't share that list with you. I'm sorry about that because many of these organizations and people uh, would be unhappy with that. But I can assure you that it's a very long list. It includes religious organizations, political organizations, human rights advocates, even uh, animal rights activists. We've got contacts with uh, the, the civil society in its broadest sense. And our policy in Havana is to welcome anybody who asks to come in. We don't slam the door in anybody's face. There are serious difficulties we face in Havana, but we're always happy to welcome representatives of civil society. I think I did mention to civil society, perhaps uh, I didn't do so explicitly by that name, but we think the role of civil society is, is very important indeed, and we are happy to listen, and indeed uh, I'm here partly to listen. And if, to conclude, if I may, I would like to make clear that the agreement we're trying to negotiate it will include all fundamental components such as are provided for in EU guidelines for this kind of agreement. Be in no doubt, human rights are a fundamental agreement. In other words, without human rights in the agreement, there will be no agreement. 
appreciate that uh, uh, you did accept the invitation and uh, you came uh, to speak to us. Uh, uh, we also do appreciate that you speak of uh, the inclusion of uh, these fundamental rights uh, in agreement. I think the point really is that there should be concrete uh, obligations uh, and there should be a concrete conditionality between those. But as I've said, I already have a few colleagues and also other attendees. Uh, I would appreciate if each of you would, uh, first of all, uh, uh, introduce himself or herself. Uh, and uh, let's try to be brief. We are limited in time. Uh, please, uh, I'll start with uh, Renate Weber, who was the first uh, to raise her hand. Thank you very much, and thanks, Fernando Faber, for organizing this hugely important debate. My name is Renate Weber. I'm a member of the Liberal Group here in the European Parliament. I'm from Romania, a country which uh, knows a lot about dictatorships and communism, regrettably. And certainly, uh, I, I, I welcome what we've heard this morning. Now, the question isn't so much, has Cuba changed? Or perhaps, if we ask that question, there are other questions we need to ask as well. No, no, to ask some of them. Is there the real political will among the citizenry at large to change and move towards a properly functioning democracy with opposition parties, uh, elections, a strong civil society, and the respect of human rights? Another question. Can the EU help Cuba down this path? What is better? An isolated Cuba uh, in company with uh, traditional friends, authoritarian friends, or a Cuba that works with uh, the USA, an EU that changes and becomes a properly functioning democracy? That's really a rhetorical question, but a very specific question now, if I may. Last week, we met uh, a group of opposition politicians from Venezuela. EU-US-Cuba dialogue is important. Do you think it could have an impact on, on other uh, big countries in uh, Latin America, uh, particularly uh, one country which has this uh, 21st century socialism, which received a lot of support from Cuba. Questions at, at once, so that we are not pressed at the very end. Uh, maybe, Karim, I would ask you, is there a will in Cuba uh, to change? I mean, about among the, the uh, uh, population. Uh, that's uh, the first question that I would ask you to deal with. Thank you for that question. because it's directly about what our intentions and desires are. Let me go back to the question of communication. Most Cubans, and it is after all the, the Cubans out on the street that will decide the future of the country, don't know much about politics. You have a population there where, where you say politics and people, you know, fall down on their knees. People, people run scared after so many years of dictatorship, uh, uh, intimidation and fear. Uh, there's self-censorship. And I'm talking about all Cubans. Everyone's scared. Everyone's afraid. So, so we can't reach out to people. We don't really know what people really want. The, the only political will that exists in the country is one type of political will. And it's completely wrong-headed. It abuses, it punishes, it imprisons. 
And that's why the Straits to Florida are reddened with blood. The walls of prisons are smeared with the pain of people. I don't want to over-dramatize here. People who've been in jail will know what I'm talking about. If you would get involved in politics, I'm a political what you you pay with death, you pay with pain. You pay like Harold Cepedo, Osvaldo Paya, the Arrescate brothers. So many Cubans paid the very highest price. There are Cubans out there who are paying the price. They're being beaten just to have for having different opinions. Just because they were with Tanya Brugueras a young uh, academic woman who went to USA, who came back and wanted to speak, and who asked people to come along and, and speak with her. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. So it's not about, it's not about saying, I want black, or I want white. No, it's about pain. It's about fear. When you're 18, 19, if you've got an idea of your own, you're worried about this. I don't know if I'm asking you a question, but there's no political will because we don't know what political will really is. Because if you, if you even start coming close to this, people start censoring themselves. They start shutting down. You've, you've, you've got to, you know, get your makeup on, as it were. This makes me profoundly sad. On the other hand, it makes us strong. What can we do? Who can help us? Uh, thank you. Uh, the second question, uh, uh, can the EU help? I think that we have already uh, heard it uh, from uh, Fernando Ponce Canto, but uh, uh, maybe from uh, Martin Paulo's uh, point of view. But again, Martin, we, we've got uh, a I number of questions uh, to follow. Very, very, very brief. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, certainly yes. Uh, the EU can help, but the EU also can make damage. Uh, and I think that one of the key uh, things is the relationship with independent civil society. What Eric uh, uh, said was absolutely right, that civil society must somehow participate in the process, and obviously the participation of civil society uh, in interstate negotiations is a, a specific thing. So there must be forms how to do it, but at the same time this civil society must be independent. We know from our own uh, experience, just close to 1989, how uh, creative our uh, totalitarian government was to suggest some contacts with civil society, which was, uh, you know, in this language, gongo, uh, government-operated civil society, uh, uh, so independent civil society, which is registered with the uh, uh, um, uh, interior ministry and is not uh, giving space to real uh, free voices like Elisandos or Antonios or uh, Rosas or whoever is on that side. I think that the European Union really must uh, take this as a priority number one because without that there will be no positive result. Uh, thank you, Renata. I know that you had a third question, but if you would uh, allow me maybe to proceed so that we can cover uh, more people. Whatever I think we, if you ask uh, the second political call. Thank you. I was going to speak in English, but uh, I'm Cuban. Uh, my mother tongue is Spanish. I'm a former political prisoner. I was in prison for uh, 16 years in Cuba. Now, the reason I was jailed uh, were because we had the support of the International Social Democrats. And I wasn't shot as a result of that. Thanks to the Socialist International Latin America, I, I managed to, uh, to survive, and that's because I'm a Social Democrat myself. Romulo Betancourt, President, Pepe Figueres, Lopez Mateo, Yano Cuadro, another Latin American president, asked Fidel Castro directly to please respect my life and respect the life of Alfredo Sanchez, the son of uh, Aureliano Sanchez, who was Minister of Education and Foreign Affairs Minister in Cuba. He was a professor of law of Anna University too, but anyway, 
Instead, we were condemned to 60 years imprisonment. 30 in prison and 30 without uh, political or civil rights. Um, and I'm still subject to that penalty. Now, I endorse what my co Cuban colleagues have said here today. I certainly agree with what Elise Anderson, what Rodriguez said, Erica, uh, what they've said has spoken volumes. I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Mr. Paloch, uh, my dear friend. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your concern about Cuba. I mean, that's clearly reflected in the fact that you organized today's event. Thank you for your concern and desire to help the people of Cuba. I live in the United States of America, not because I particularly want to, but because I'm a political exile. There are a million odd Cubans who left the country, many of them for political reasons. We had to leave because we couldn't continue living in Cuba because uh, you know, our life was under threat, genuinely under threat. Other political prisoners, friends from jail, asked me to convey to you a request and a message. I'm the spokesperson for uh, an, a, a group of political prisoner associations that I've got a list. I'm not going to read it out. It's way too long. And I also represent civil society, such as my brother, Rene gomez Manchana. He's a member of a dissident lawyers association in, in Cuba. And I'm uh, also a member because I'm a lawyer myself. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer in Cuba, but I uh, practice in the United States. All of them asked me to say the following to you. And do convey this to those that are not here. Pass it on. Cuban civil society, the people of Cuba, have huge hopes pinned on the European Parliament. Put pressure on the Cuban government and get them to respect human rights. Genuinely respect them. No more human rights abuses. We've heard about them today. We heard from Karina. We heard from Elisardo. Elisardo is keeping a catalogue of the daily abuses. So relations with Cuba should be conditional to respect for human rights. That was what was agreed at a meeting in Miami. And let me say to you that there is considerable unity, unity that didn't exist, unity between organizations in exile and organizations in civil society in Cuba. For us, it's a source of pride to see how in, in a moment of crisis, such as supervened after the reestablishment of relations between the, the, the US and Cuba, once again, we saw the beating heart of the people of Cuba. And uh, we, we managed to hold out uh, our hand to each other and I would reach out with this hand of friendship to all my Cuban brothers and sisters. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak here to you today. Much indeed. Um, uh, I, I need to close the list now. And looking at the time, I'm afraid that I will be able to give, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm afraid we won't make it, but uh, some of us might be able to stay afterwards, maybe for bilateral interactions. I think that looking at the watch, we will be able to, don't worry, you're on the list, we will be able to take uh, three questions now, maybe at once, and then we will have a reaction from, from the panelists. The first is Javier Nach. Javier, if, we, if you can, as big as possible. We yeah. have 10 minutes. Yeah. Bueno, para mí Cuba no es como para... Cuba is, is not just a brother country. It's part of uh, Spain's body and soul. For me, Cuba and Spain are closely inter interweaved, dovetailed. 
you all know this. What I'm surprised about is uh, this uh, wishful thinking that our hopes will become reality. We want to get. We have to understand the interlocutor if we want to meet with success, and this in is an interlocutor, which on the 31st of December 1959 came to power with the intention never to release it. We're talking about a, a gerontocracy, a nomenclatura that has no capacity to renew itself because the only way for it to stay in power is to preserve its privileges, and that means to, to, to not allow for any openness, any Fisher at all. I, I, I knew the Frankist dictatorship, and it's completely different to the Castro dictatorship. Look, let's get one thing on board. If you want your daughter to go to university in Cuba, you've got to be from a revolutionary family. If you want a job in Cuba, we've got to get, get the green light of the revolutionary defense committee, because otherwise you won't get a decent job. You need to have the star worker status to get that job. Come on, let's get this on board. There's been no possibility of freedom in Cuba. And I'm saying this to the commission, and I'm saying this to the negotiate. If in Cuba, come on, open your eyes, see what's happening in Cuba. There is no possibility to change the system because the system has not budged an inch in 50 plus years in the exercise of absolute power. We're, we're not, we can't talk about the creation of a middle class that will lead to strategic social change. No, we're talking about a radical authoritarian power that does not acknowledge any alternative to its absolute hold on power. That is the reality of Cuba. So I, I have to be vehemently critical of the commission here. What do you want, freedom or business? If it's business, we're about, hey, come on, let's uh, negotiate with Cuba. But let's not fool ourselves, and let's not tell tall tales. These business deals won't create a civil society. They will merely perpetuate the Castro regime because they'll die until they die. Anything else is just wishful, wishful thinking and grandstanding words, and I'm saying this on the basis of experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, because you uh, facilitated also uh, the moment I will hand over uh, to Fernando for wrapping up because uh, I was going to say in uh, just a few sentences exactly the same that you have just said. The lady there in the middle, in the, in the glasses, uh, please, uh, and uh, please be brief as, as possible. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Deborah Newton Cook, and I'd like to pick up a point made by um, this year, uh, the director from EEAS. Uh, about negotiations for what I assume might become a trade agreement. And then um, we've had various witness statements about the state of human rights. Uh, now, I wonder if we're going towards the infamous Article 2 on human rights, which the Commission has never, ever imposed. We've got this example of Israel and 10,000-plus Palestinians on administrative detention, including elected members. Catherine Ashdown never, ever enforced Article 2. So what is the point of putting it in a future trade agreement if it's not going to be respected? That's what people are crying out for now. Please respect human rights. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that uh, the, this event today is very much about Article 2. I think that this, in, in other words, that has been said today by all the panelists, including uh, uh, Fernando and myself, I think was very much along the lines. I, I think we can ha take one maximum tour. The gentleman uh, uh, now drinking his cup of tea has the floor. Bueno, muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Alberto. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Alberto. I'm from Cuba as well. Um, I've found what's been said here today hugely interesting. Regrettably, I have to take a different view. I suppose this makes it more democratic here. I think the organizers have invited um, some representatives of uh, some of civil society. But as a Cuban, I would have liked uh, you to invite representatives of human society that are 
are legally acknowledged by international organization. What we've heard here is hugely interesting. Some things uh, are a complete novelty to me. I'm familiar with the gentleman on the top table. I know Mr. Rodiles. I live abroad. But I have to agree th that people in, in Cuba are uninformed. Millions of dollars are invested in keeping the uh, Cuban government, uh, the, the USA, invest in this. And Mr. Rodiles has a TV program which is broadcast to, to Cubans and all sorts of instruments. Half a million Cubans that live in Miami visit the island. This is out of the million or so emigres. So if I may share my viewpoint, I think the Commission should focus on the main components of EU Cuba relation. The composition is an anachronism. Everybody knows that. And I think. With the with uh, the negotiations with USA, this is all the more outdated. Articles are being applied to Cuba that aren't applied to anybody else, and we Cuban citizens, the people of Cuba, are suffering from this. We're bearing the brunt of it. Mauro, Mr. Mauro talk, talked about poverty. Uh, I find it a bit funny to hear Spaniards preaching about poverty. Hmm. Mr. Nart started talking about Frankism. Well, obviously, Frank and Spain has nothing to do with Cuba, and yes, we are a poor country. But it doesn't mean that we should exploit that poverty. Or, or neither does it mean that Spain will be able to do much about that poverty. My question is perfectly straightforward. When will the real representatives of the Cuban people be invited? Or when will we, you invite along representatives of the Cuban government? When will the Commission change its discriminatory policies uh, that it imposes on Cuba? Thank you. Thank you, and uh, uh, I respect what you say. Uh, as I've said, uh, uh, this is not uh, the only event that we've organized. I think that uh, we can then uh, maybe talk uh, whom you think that concretely we have neglected. Uh, I must say that uh, the representatives that uh, have been invited, uh, uh, we see them differently. Uh, we have uh, been in touch with them uh, for a long time. Many of them have a long-standing record. I, I'm in this respect surprised by your words, but uh, having said that, I'm sure we are open to uh, other entities to be invited in the future. And uh, we definitely uh, uh, were uh, ready to welcome uh, a Cuban uh, uh, embassy representative here today, but this unfortunately didn't take, uh, take place. So I leave it there. We we happy to have uh, someone like that in any of the future events. Now, uh, I need to... Uh, uh, basically cut it here, and before asking uh, each of the panelists to react very quickly, and I'll start with Mr. Ponce uh, Canto, because he is here a little bit on the defensive side, so I think that he should have uh, uh, slightly, slightly more time in this respect. But uh, as uh, then uh, Fernando uh, will, uh, will take over, uh, the, the, the main, I would say, uh, messages, the main points, the main words that I would li also like to sort of throw on the panelists, uh, uh, would be <coughs> un unconditional release of all political prisoners, pluralism, uh, then uh, uh, integration of opposition, I mean uh, having the EU entities speaking to the representatives, uh, and we can then discuss who exactly those are, just to refer to you, uh, in the debate, so that this is not uh, about them uh, with, without them, and I do respect what uh, 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 it has been sent uh, uh, by Mr. Ponscanto, but, uh, but still. Uh, and uh, the, the last word is conditionality. I mean, uh, the, the political dialogue, respect of human rights, they have to be filled in the agreement with content. And I have to refer to what you have said, Madam, Article, article 2 in this respect. So I'll stop here. We are running out of time. I would uh, ask Mr. Ponscanto to uh, be the first to speak. I'm afraid so that Fernando would have a few minutes to wrap up with some conclusions. I would ask uh, within one or two minutes, uh, uh, you may be one and a half, the rest in one, one minute, just a quick reactions, uh, referring to some of the questions. Uh, and I'm sure those that could uh, put their question and might not be satisfied either by the composition or what has been said, we will have more opportunities in the future. So uh, the floor is yours, and then I would take it from the right, to, from my right to the left, and then hand over to Fernando. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terichka, and uh, thank you to all speakers. 
Yes, as negotiators, uh, we are criticized. Sometimes we're criticized for being too strict. Sometimes we're criticized for not being strict enough. So maybe we're getting it right vaguely. At least I hope so. Maybe that is wishful thinking on my part. Anyway, in any event, we are operating within the negotiating mandate from the EU. And it was Council that determined that negotiating this agreement was uh, the way forward, the tool to promote the objectives of the common position. Once again, these objectives are strengthening the process of uh, uh, reform, promoting democracy and human rights. And uh, I think um, we're all in agreement on this. And ha the question is how? Uh, Mrs. Weber made a very apposite point of this. How can we help Cuba? Is an isolated Cuba better than a Cuba with which we are engaged in critical dialogue? For many years, we have believed that critical dialogue can help promote the objectives, uh, which uh, are the same across the board with all countries. Obviously, it is up to the democratic institutions of the EU to determine whether the agreement is acceptable. And of course, the European Parliament will vote on it too, as is only right and proper. But I think we can be sure that we're going to try to negotiate the very best agreement possible with the ultimate aim of promoting our key objectives. We want partnership with the Cuban authorities. That's an obligation. And also we want partnership with civil society. We're working very hard to try to get Cuba to ratify UN conventions on human rights. That's one topic on many, but a very important one, and I did want to highlight it. I don't think I have a lot more time, but I would like to conclude by thanking the organizers, particularly Mr. Maura, Mr. Talitska, and everybody else, for giving me this opportunity to explain to you the negotiating process. It's a solid process. It's a transparent process which uh, counts on civil society. And uh, if conditions allow, it would lead to agreement. If not, it won't. But in any, any event, we will continue to promote the same objectives. To conclude, allow me to say, I think what a spe a speaker said, uh, I spoke sp Spanish. Now, perhaps as a Spaniard, uh, uh, I believe that uh, closeness of Cuba and the EU is not uh, uh, a chance. We have uh, strong cultural and human bonds, which I think uh, puts the conditions in place to achieve uh, what we, I think, all hope for. Thank you very much. And I'm here to answer any questions. I feel you're an explicit uh, uh, reflection of Article 2, but uh, we hope we will have more time for that in the future. And now, from uh, my right, I'll start with you. Uh, if I may ask you as brief as you can be. Briefly, there's uh, one point I think that w we haven't really fielded. I feel convinced that what civil society wants is Cuba is to enjoy its rights. And that was there in the Varela project uh, with 25,000 signatories. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's allow this to, to grow and spread. We don't, we don't need to negotiate with Fidel Castro or Raul Castro's government. They don't know anything about negotiating. We don't need to negotiate. We need backing so that uh, Cubans can go to the ballot and uh, they will be international friends and they can say, I don't want this suffering anymore. Look, Cubans uh, sometimes resort to, to violent solutions, and that's not something we want. We, we need support to international observers, free elections. We need Cubans to know that they've got a choice, and that's something that all Cubans want. That's what we need. Uh, human rights must be respected, and it must be a, a, a condition for the European Union to insist on this. We need to have free elections. All Cubans should be able to go to the ballot box. International observers 
should be impartial. And they shouldn't in any way be influenced by the government. Quite often we see that behind those negotiating, the other people behind them uh, who are doing something else. When we debunk the myth of the Cuban revolution, we will make a major step forward. Cuba isn't what people have had sold to them. It's not education and health care. Sorry, it's not about that. Cuba is something altogether different. Let's look at what there isn't, not what there is. Yes, thank you. I want to take up three of the speakers. The young man who just spoke now. You said that uh, the panel isn't really representative. Well, look. Sad to say, so-called NGOs in uh, Cuba are just uh, basically under the control of uh, the government. The same happened uh, in uh, the Soviet bloc. It's all very good and well to, 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 to invite along diplomats from the dictatorship, but they're unlikely to attend. They're not really particularly well disposed to engage in dialogue. And perhaps I can conclude by referring to Mrs. Weber, who has always got an in interesting take on things. To her, I would say, over there, we've got a dictatorship which uh, is very similar to the one you suffered in your country. But it's uh, something of a hybrid. It uh, copies from uh, totalitarian regimes, such as Mr. Ceausescu and his notorious Secretati. But in Cuba, we've got that with a Latin American style dictatorship, the Latin American style strongman. So that means we've got a state which has a, a particular predisposition to engage in intimidation and social control. I'd also have to thank Mr. Nart, who was, uh, who was uh, very pithy. Thank you. Thank you. No, sorry, uh, no time for that. But uh, uh, people that know me know that I'm a very polite person, so I really try to answer in a very polite way. Uh, but I mean, if, if you look at these people and if you say that uh, they are not representative, then I have only one word that comes up to my mind that's absolutely rubbish. Now, uh, Martina, one, one minute, uh, Max, uh, uh, Rick as well, and then uh, Fernando, uh, whatever. Only a very close. I think that this discussion uh, very nicely has demonstrated that we uh, need uh, to go on with this communication. Uh, uh, to uh, the gentleman uh, uh, speaking about, I would say, representativity of this panel, I myself would be very glad if we can see here, for instance, Mariela Castro Espin sitting together with uh, Elisardo Sanchez, Antonio Rodriguez, and having a uh, dialogue. Um, I would uh, doubt that people like her would be willing to do that, but if it were possible, it would be a great, uh, a great progress. I agree um, with a, a somewhat skeptical description of the situation, Elisardo and a uh, gentleman over there as far as the regime, uh, nature of this regime and intentions. But still, I am an optimist, agreeing with those who uh, uh, believe in the power of Cuban civil society and the hope for the freedom. I, I think that thi if this is given a chance, I think that Cuba can become a very successful case of democratization, a positive example uh, we need today, but not because of the intentions of the current government, but because of the will of the people. And I think that this is the uh, ambition and uh, role and task of the parliament to support that. Thank you. Thank you. Just one word on the representativity. I must say that what we also tried is that we are liberals uh, to invite representatives from uh, all, all parts of the political spectrum in Cuba. Uh, just one minute, sorry. I think the important topic that, that was discussed earlier was what, what should the European Union demand from the Cuban government in order to, to sign this, this uh, political dialogue and, and cooperation agreement? And, and that is exactly the question that should be sent to the Cuban civil society. And it should be sent in a formal and transparent way, inviting them to write papers, to participate in debates openly, 
on what should the European Union demand from the Cuban government. Because the Cuban government will never ask its own people on what they could accept in order to, to sign this agreement. So that would be the core thing that we should ask. Don't ask, us, don't ask the Europeans, we should ask the Cuban civil society this question. And it should be done in a formal and transparent way. And in the European Union uh, Commission has a, 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 a web page called Your Voice in Europe, where we ask the Europeans, or where the Commission asks the Europeans on their opinions on all kinds of matters. And that same thing could be done easily open for the Cubans so that they can have their opinion in this uh, negotiation. That is thank you. Uh, I, I need to add one more thing, and that is that the papers that Antonio Rodiles referred to, the platform for the current negotiations and the, the 404 uh, democracy and, and liberty, both platforms are on the table over there. So just so I'll refer to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, co-organizer, uh, Fernando Purepap, uh, and bring us with some conclusions. Fernando, thank you. Gracias, Pavel. <coughs> thank you, Pavel. This debate here in Brussels in the European Parliament could have been held in Havana. And if that had been possible, a lot of the debate wouldn't have uh, made any sense at all. But we couldn't do that. And that's precisely why we have a massive challenge before us. And that is the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms on the island of Cuba. I think we've allowed people who know the situation in Cuba to speak today, and that, was, and that has proved most instructive, and in that sense, I hope we've achieved the aim of this event. But it's an initial step forward, and as, Mr. And as Pavel pointed out, this won't be the end of it. We're going to flank you and assist you in this process in the European Parliament. We've always done that at other moments, uh, perhaps uh, some of us in different roles. Now, many have asked, what are we going to do with the 96 common position? Should we change it in the light of current circumstances? Shall we adapt the fundamental ideas to changing circumstances? Well, the common position says that any progress in trade relations between the EU and Cuba should be reflected in a in progress by the regime on human rights. And that's, that's quite a bit, actually. I think it's entirely consistent to take up the challenge we heard from Elizardo. We must close the political prison that is Cuba. We must do so unconditionally. I think that's one initiative that's essential. And I, and I will be submitting a, uh, an oral question to Mrs. Mongarini, and all LD members are welcome to sign it. We've talked a lot about civil society and dissidents. I think the, the, their witness must be part of this process. Mr. Mr. Ponth. I think we in the EU need to look at ways to include civic society in this process, and that's not going to be an easy task. But I think they have to be interlocutors for the EU if we are to know exactly what kind of progress is really happening. And perhaps before the uh, March round of negotiations, some kind of meeting with civic society would be appropriate. I think we should also propose the creation of some sort of informal Friends of Cuba group that uh, would be cross-party in the European Parliament. They would monitor the process in Cuba and be in ongoing contact with civil society and Cuban dissidents. But now can I turn to you, dear guest? In civil society in Cuba, you need to work in a united fashion. I think it's, uh, I think political factionism and division is an inheritance you get from Spain, which is rather unfortunate, but I think you can shrug that off. In Spain, we also say that unity is strength. Thanks very much. 
and uh, thank you all for speaking.